Well, there does seem to be a little bit of a consensus in our culture that there is a crisis of faith. People have not decreased in their spirituality, but they don't identify with any organized religion. Often, this is referred to as the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not the other type of nuns down the street. You see, people who do not, this is those people that do not identify with any organized religion, 29% as of 2019, almost one third of Americans. <clears throat> it's not because people are less religious either. Just swing by the local sports bar during the next Eagles game and ask who the regulars are. There's plenty of religious people out there. There are plenty of spiritual people, too. Many of these people report that they are spiritually minded. They just don't identify with organized religion. So if people are not less spiritual, nor are they any less religious, then what is the problem? I would suggest to you this morning that the church has failed in communicating faith, what faith is, and who our faith is needs to be focused on. Even in how we speak about faith culturally, how I exercise my faith. Typically, it speaks about the individual practices, not us as a community. We have lost the communal aspect of faith. The expression that more is caught than taught rings true, though, doesn't it? As we come together, as we spend time with one another, we see one another's faith, and it strengthens and encourages us. We have fellowship meals intentionally, even when it is a bit of a pain once a month to drag your lunch with you to church. Honestly, last night I was not really in the mood for making soup, but I know this afternoon I will be glad for it. As we are looking at the Advent, as we are looking at the coming of Christ through the Psalms, we turn our attention this morning and see how the Psalms point us to faith and assurance in Christ. In Psalm 103 this morning, we will see praise, we will see the praise to the King. We will see personal benefits from the King, public benefits from the King, and finally praise the King, all of creation. Please, I hope you'll pray with me as we get started. Father, we thank you that you are over all our difficulties. You are over all our crises. You are all over all of our problems and our trials this morning. Lord, as we come to you, the things that are monumental to us are simple to you because you are the one who has the power over them. You are the one who reigns in the midst of our pain and our suffering and our struggles. You are the creator, the redeemer, the God who is, the one who has the power of life and death and holds the keys to them all. Lord, we come seeking you this morning as we come to your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So, this morning as we look to see faith through the Psalms, we need to remember a couple things. First, that faith is best understood as in three kind of things that go into it. First, knowledge, understanding of things, okay? Agreement with those things or assent in saying that we affirm that these things are good and then trusting in those things, trusting in that knowledge. And so as we talked last week, we, we mentioned that faith looks backwards, because faith is based on knowledge. It's based on facts. It's based on real things. It's not just wishful thinking. It is not just a pie in the sky dream that we think of things that are pleasant to make us feel better or comfort our fears. But it is based on real things. 
this morning, the only context that the Psalms give us about this Psalm is that it is of David, who is the type of Christ as king. He is the archetype of king in the Old Testament, if you will. He is the pinnacle of the kings of the Old Testament. He is said to be a man after God's own heart. And so we see he is the man of faith acting in our stead. The one who brings about the the kingly covenant, the Davidic covenant to his people, that God uses David as a mediator between himself and man. And we find that this comes in book four of the Psalms. In book four of the Psalms, there's an overall projection that focuses around comfort in crisis for God's people, particularly through the man of God. As you look at all the Psalms in book four, there typically seems to be some sort of crisis of faith or crisis that the people of God are dealing with. And the Psalms resolve it with faith through the man of God. And you say, what about Psalm 103? Where is the crisis, Pastor? He doesn't tell us what's wrong. He just says that we should bless the Lord. Well, we have to understand, this was a collaboration. So we see the crisis in Psalm 102, just before that. You see, Psalm 102 is a great cry out to God in prayer. God, the psalmist has turned to himself and says praise the Lord as he comes to the conclusion in Psalm 102 in Psalm 103 he says then praise the Lord I will reject my crisis I will reject the things that I am afflicted by I will reject my complaints and I will praise the Lord in the midst of these things you see Psalm 102 presents us with the crisis that he has been afflicted, that he is under persecution. And 103 is the response. And so, with those things in mind, we should consider them this morning. But I want to encourage you, but also warn you. See, be careful. Just as James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4 tells us, That when we ask for faith, it comes through endurance. Endurance comes from crisis. Faith is produced by struggling through difficulties. And so that's what we see when we come to 103, that the psalmist has endured Psalm 102. He has encouraged us through the trials, through his doubts, through his worries, through his affliction, to bring us Psalm 103 and to remind us of what we should do in the midst of that. So, I would suggest to you that this is a song of faith that looks back and gives hopes based on the acts of God in the past. And we'll see those things this morning. So, first... Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, it is a praise to the king. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. It begins with the call to the whole self to praise God. In verse 1 there, all that is within me, oh my soul, the soul is the essence of who you are. Not your arms and your limbs, but who God has created you. The very essence of the being, of the person, the individual that you are. And the psalmist is reminding himself to praise God or bless God. Last week we talked about the blessed... That is a completely different word than bless this morning. The word in that the ESV translate bless here is more akin to praise or worship or kneeling before God. And so other translations use the word praise in substitution of bless. 
You see, and then he goes on and he says, forget not all his benefits. And he uses the Lord's personal name, the name that signifies, it identifies God. Not just a generic king or a generic God, but the God who of Israel, the God who has revealed himself in the pages of the scriptures. And he says, do not forget all of his benefits, all the things that comprise the Father. You see, what are those things? What are the things that are the benefits of God? And then in verses 3 through 5, he's going to go on to tell us the personal benefits that come from the king. But before we get to there, do you remember what we were saying a couple weeks ago when we were in 1 Thessalonians? When we were talking about giving thanks? You see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul is coming to the conclusion of this book and he gives us that long list of things to do. In one of those things, he says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Notice how he doesn't say that you are to be thankful in all circumstances, but give thanks in all circumstances. So find something to be thankful for. Paul is reminding us that we are not to, be, to find the joy in all circumstances, but we're to find something to be thankful for because God has blessed us. We're going to find joy when we are grateful. We will find joy when we have found that we can find the thanksgiving of the things of God in all circumstances. He's not dismissing that things are difficult. He's not dismissing that trials come. But he's saying there is something to be thankful in there, is there not? Are you upright? Are you breathing? Are you moving? Has God not shown grace on you this morning? Even in the midst of our trials, we can find things to be thankful for. That God has not left us alone. He has not left us on our own. So he said, give thanks in all circumstances. <clears throat> so, but what are the things that, we, that cause us to forget all the benefits of the Lord? What are the ways we forget all the benefits of the Lord? I think it's quite easy, isn't it? It seems that we get, often get caught up in our own difficulties, our own struggles, when we have a cough that won't go away, or a persistent ache or pain, or troubles at home, or troubles at work, I don't know about you, I think one of the things that causes me to forget the benefits of God is when I become callous to them because they become so familiar to them. I think to myself, oh, I know God loves me, but. I know God forgives me, but. I know God shows mercy to me, but. I become callous to those things rather than Remind myself of how merciful God is. How much he has loved me through Christ, his son, who died for my sins. How much my sin is an offense to him that he is forgiven. I become callous because I'm so familiar with them. We read them, we pass over them so quickly in scripture. They're so familiar to us if we've been in church for a long time. We have lost that freshness, that newness of the forgiveness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. It's so easy to do, is it not? I find that as I become callous to those things and I pass over them so quickly and easily and I do not meditate on them, I do not reflect upon them, I then become callous to the world. I become insensitive to my brother or sister who is hurting. I become neglectful of my duties as a man of God, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor sometimes. 
As I become callous because of the familiarity with God's grace on me, I become callous to the world, callous to those whom I love. Let us not do that. Let us rip off that callous. Let us become soft to the things of God. Let us meditate on the love of God that he has shown us through Christ Jesus. Let us meditate on the forgiveness that we have in our Lord. Let us not forget the mercy he shows us every day. Yes, there will be trials. Yes, there will be difficulty. There will be struggles. They are, new, they are renewed every day, and they pile up so quickly. Yet, <clears throat> God has been gracious to us. So let us find places to give thanks in all circumstances, as Paul tells us. And the psalmist is pointing to us this morning, reminding us that we are to bless the Lord, to praise God in all circumstances. So, <clears throat> we've seen how the psalmist tells us to remind ourselves, <clears throat> um, reminds ourselves to praise the Lord. But now he tells us the personal benefits that come from the king. And he goes through and he lists these things in verses 3 through 5. He tells us who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles. Do you hear that repetition in there? You, 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 your, you, your. He is personalizing this. He's showing that these things are for the individual. These things are for you. Are you in need of forgiveness this morning? Are you in need of healing this morning? Do you need to be redeemed from the pit this morning? The psalmist does not pull these things from midair, though. He does not pull these things out of a hat or out of his back pocket, but rather he pulls them from the pages of Scripture. He pulls them from the context of the Ten Commandments. You see, prior to Moses receiving the commandments in Exodus 34, he tells us these things. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a merciful God and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast for the thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and sin, but he, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the sins upon the fathers, on the children, and the children's children, unto the third and fourth generations. And then he goes on, and he gives the commandments. You see, God's law was founded on God's character. The character of God is revealed in the law. And that's what the psalmist is drawing upon. He's drawing upon what is foundational to the law of God, which is the character of God. Forgiveness, healing. When he talks about healing all your diseases, it's about restoration. Restoring things. Don't we sing that at Christmas time? Restoring things as far as the curse is found. Redeeming you from the pit, which is a euphemism for Sheol or the grave or death. Has Christ not breathed life into your life this morning? He talks about crowning you with steadfast love and mercy. <clears throat> Why would God show mercy on man? Have you ever thought that question? Why would God be merciful to us? I think the more I've talked with many of you, I think you've asked that question, why would God show mercy on me? I can understand some of these other people, but why me? Because he knows our frailty. He knows we are dust. And he knows he has the power. He is the one with the power of life. His word gives life to man. 
He knows that we are in how, who we are in relation to Him. Can you say the same this morning? Has your Christian life been about serving you or about serving the King? Do you know who you are in relation to God? Or have you made yourself God? Have you taken the king off the throne and sat upon it yourself? You see, the psalmist reminds us that God knows who we are. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our frailties. He knows your shortcomings. You cannot hide them from him. And yet, he has mercy upon us. He knows the things that are in your heart. And yet, he does not hold back his mercy. Instead, he pours it out upon his beloved people, time and time again. As I was pondering this, as I was thinking this through, I was thinking about what is the purpose of, of freedom in the Christian life. What is the purpose of freedom in the Christian life? Not what is the purpose of the Christian life. We know that. The Westminster Confession clears that up for us very clearly and concisely. But what is the purpose of freedom in the Christian life? It is to serve the king and the kingdom. Is it not? He gives us freedom. He doesn't tell us that we need to wear red shirts on Sundays. But he gives us freedom to choose and to serve him in a way that glorifies him. Let's us use our decision making. Allow us to seek out wisdom so that we can glorify him as we live life before others. I think that is the purpose of freedom in the Christian life. So that we can be glorifying to God as we live out life before others. Because that serves the king in the kingdom. But in verse 6 there, he begins to shift. He begins to turn from individual blessings to living in the kingdom as he shows us the public benefits from the king. Now often when we think of public benefits, we think of things that are good for the whole, all those around us. And when we look at the Old Testament, (laughs) we must think in terms of covenants. Remember, David is writing this under the Mosaic Covenant in which is about law-keeping. It's about doing the good things, doing the right things, following after the law, which is pointing us towards Christ, the man of God. So David is thinking through this, and he's thinking about what was the... The point of the law was to show us the way, to show us righteousness, to enact justice for all those people, for the people of God. Isn't that the king's job is to serve justice, keep the rule of law? So as David is thinking this through, as he is meditating on this, how is God preserving us through the midst of trials? It is for the good of the people is for the good of all that we would enact justice. And so we'll see that the law, if you recall, when we look at the Ten Commandments, we think of it in two aspects, in two divisions. The first is our behavior before God, the Father, and then the second is how we live before man, our interactions with man. Commandments 1 through 4 focus on our relationship to God. Commandments 5 through 10 focus on how we interact with one another. And they focus in on those things. And they interact. They overlap. They weave together to produce something that is glorious. Even Jesus himself, in summarizing the law in Matthew 22, has to do it in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see, your faith is not just about you and God. God's covenants were never for an individual. They were always for a people. 
but they came through a person, a mediator. You see that? Do you see? The Abrahamic covenant was not for Abraham alone, but for him and his posterity. The Davidic kingdom, the Davidic covenant was given to David for the good of Israel, so that they would have a king that would sit on the throne eternally. A good king who would serve God, who would love the Lord and love his people. You see how that works? The covenants were never for an individual alone, but they were always for all of God's people. And yet today, we often think about our faith for ourselves alone, do we not? We fail to think of how our faith impacts the people of God. That would be a great discussion question, I think. How does my faith individually, how does my faith individually impact the people of God? Well, first I think is that we can see that we are not alone. That we can overcome just as those around us do. Many of you have faced all kinds of trials. Probably some that you have never even shared with others. And yet, you get up and you're here. And I draw strength from that. Some of the most difficult times in my life, in the most challenges to my faith, are when I see my brothers and sisters who I thought were faithful fall away from the faith or reject the truth of God. Perhaps we disagreed about certain things, but I would never assume that they had, would fall away from the faith. Most recently, I've heard of a friend that has fallen into great sin. And he seems to have abandoned the faith. Seems to abandon reality. And yet... I still pray for him. I still pray for his family, that they would overcome as well, that they would be faithful to love him, but also show truth with him and care for him. I don't know about you, but when I see those whom I thought were faithful fall, it makes me question myself even. So what should I do? Turn to Christ. Turn to the faithfulness of God, the one who never fails the one who upholds his word. <clears throat> the one who knows who, how frail and weak I am. Who knows that we are made of dust and that we fail. So, this morning, we have been pressing forward at a rapid pace. We have seen praise of the king and the personal and public benefits from the king and finally we call all of creation to praise the king so this morning we've been circulating somewhere at about a 10,000 range of this psalm there are so many details that we could have gone into I had to leave so many things out this morning that I wanted to touch on and share with you but I knew we could never get to it and apparently my voice would never let me get to it either this morning but instead of going verse by verse we've been trying to chunk away at this to show us the blessings that God has not just for you as an individual but us as a people us as a church us as a people who have been called out from the darkness into the light and he began with calling us to call ourselves to praise him and now he calls all of creation to praise him and he begins at the highest most Magnificent creation that we probably know of, the angels of God. And he refers to the angels, the mighty ones, all his ministers, <coughs> his hosts, which is a military term. So we see that he, all those who serve God. And he calls them to praise the king of all creation. Not just all of creation, but over his whole dominion. 
You see, his whole dominion. This is showing the transcendency of God over all things. And all things have an obligation to worship the king. And we see all these things are coming together. But you might be thinking, well, how, how do we know he's talking about a king here? I would refer you back to verse 19. I know we blitzed over it so quickly. But it, in verse 19 it says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. At the conclusion of his benefits for all, the community of God, the people of God, the kingdom of God, he says his throne has been established in the heavens, which is above all of creation, which is above all of the problems of this world, all of our sin, all of our trials, all of our frailties. And he reigns over all. He reigns over all. And he is calling all things to worship him. So how do I praise the Lord completely? Because remember how we talked about in the beginning. That he says, within me, all that is within me, my whole soul, my very essence, all that is within me is to worship God. So how do I praise the Lord completely? Well, That's an easy question, right? Well, I think my first answer was I don't really know, honestly. As I wrote this question, I just wrote, I don't know. Then I had to think a little bit more, sleep on it a little bit. But I would encourage you, the place to start is when I'm right about something, I still repent. When I'm right about something, I still need to repent. And I tried to find a really non-controversial thing to talk about with this, and I couldn't find one. So what I chose was the role of husbands in the family. I think I'm pretty right about the role of a husband in the family. I think he should be the leader of the household. He should be the leader of faith. He should be the one who calls his family to Christ, presents Christ to his family, and glorifies them, and glorifies Christ by delivering them Christ, and delivering them to Christ as part of his act of worship. I think I'm pretty good on that. I think that's pretty biblical. You might disagree with me, but that's okay. We can talk about it later. But you know what? I still need to repent, even though I think I'm right. Because you know what? I haven't done that right. I have failed so many times in that. And in my getting it right, there were times in which I was arrogant about getting it right. And I wanted to let other people know that I got it right and they didn't. And that wasn't what Christ calls me to do. You see, when I get it right, I'm not to rub it in other, somebody else's face that they're getting it wrong, but rather, I am to lovingly come alongside them so that they would see the kingdom and how this glorifies Christ. So, how do I begin to praise the Lord completely? I would suggest that when we get it right, or we think we got it right, that we begin with repentance. <clears throat> so, This points us to the spiritual reality that we are to praise the king who graciously gives goodness to all his people based on the law, which is based on his character, for the purpose of living in the kingdom as his people. We know his character is true because of how he's acted towards his people in the past. But what do we do when we don't feel like God has shown us goodness? What do we do when things are difficult, when the bills seem to pile up, when the trouble seems to pile up, the worry begins to pile up, whatever it might be that is your affliction? 
when the illnesses begin to pile up, what do we do? I would consider his mediators first. Look at God's mediators. Look at those who he chose to bring about his covenants to his people. Noah, a drunkard, probably not a very good father. Abraham, who was a good father to one son, not to the other. Who let his wife hang out to dry multiple times. David, who was a cheater and a liar and a killer. Who was a man of blood. God knew who they were. They were men of dust. And that's why he gave us Christ. The mediator of the new covenant. The one who is. The man of God. Remember how we talked about that last week in Psalm chapter 1? In which the, the editor of the Psalms is showing us that the man of God would come to deliver us. Deliver his people. To bring them into the kingdom. To show his glory. To show what it means to be the people of God and to live in the kingdom of God. And in book four, he's showing us how to live in faith through crisis. <clears throat> so do you remember that percentage I told you earlier? 29%, right? Not that, 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 that is really all that important. In fact, I think it's actually quite low. What sort of faith stands on no history or facts? What kind of religiosity is concentrated on titles that last 12 months, like sports championships? How have we failed so miserably as the Christian church? Our faith is fixed on the eternal king of heaven who has revealed himself in time and space and flesh and blood. Blood that was shed for you and for me. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the author writes this, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom... Also, he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Have you seen the radiance of the glory of God? David, the author of Psalm 103, is looking back to what God had done for his people. Not based on their obedience, but on God's own character and God's loving compassion to uphold his covenant for his own glory so that the Son would be made known to mankind and all the nations would know him and worship him. We see a foretaste of this Christmas story, don't we? In the Christmas story, we see the Magi, those wise men coming from the east and worshiping at the feet of a child king. <clears throat> but we see it completed, and it's all in the fulfillment at his coming when he gathers the nations, when he gathers all his people all of the nation of Israel, all of those whom we've called from the nations, as he returns, just as he left. You see, even the nuns have faith. Where is your faith today? Is it in a limited knowledge of man? Is it in wishful thinking on how you think things ought to be? On your own personal experiences? Or is it on solid ground? The solid word of Christ. The solid rock. The God who is. The King eternal. Lord Jesus. Who sits at the right hand of the Father. Interceding for you and for me. All who have placed faith in him. Is your faith today on the facts? 
or is your faith on faith? Are you hoping on yourself? Trust in Christ this morning. Trust that the King is coming. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you are bigger than our problems, that your glory <laughs> shines brightly. <laughs> Even when we are dim lights, when we are but walking, talking dust, give us strength today. Lord, help us to walk in faith, that we would turn to the King, the one who is revealed in scriptures, the one who has shown the way, that has revealed your character, the Christ who is, the God who is, the one who descended to earth and ascended to the heavens where from which he had come. Lord, we ask that you would move us this morning. May we rest upon the, the beauty and the goodness of Christ this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.